everyone, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game, or in this case, board game reviews. And we're going to be looking at the Steve Finn Collection by Steve Finn Games. There are four different games here we're going to be talking about in this video, and we're going to get into them individually, but also we're going to have them all set up on the table and go through them one at a time. And the first one is going to be Mining Colony. This is a one to four player game in which you're going to be... Uh, astronauts or uh, explorers going from your planet to try and find new, more uh, resource-heavy resource planets in which you can go ahead and build mining colonies on. However, most of these planets have inhospitable environments, but they have a lot of resources, so you're going to need to build different areas on them in order to secure your future of your specific civilization. Another one here is this one here, Nanga. Parbat, which you're going to be playing as Sherpas, and you're going to be utilizing your uh, explorers as they go up to try and find Naranga Parbat, which is a mountain, by capturing animals and feeding yourself and building different tents and areas and colonies in order to secure yourself to make it to the top. Over here is Biblios, Quill and Parchment. This is a one to four player roll and write game, which players play as abbots attempting to earn their uh, benediction from the, uh, the abbot, or the main abbot, I should say, I suppose. In which case, they're going to be gathering books and reading them, as well as traveling around town and preaching and going and uh, to the monasteries and praying. And you'll be basically rolling dice and gathering as many resources as possible. And finally, the last one over here, this is the Butterfly Garden, another Steve Finn game. This one here plays two to five players. All these games take roughly 30 to uh, an hour to play. And in this one here, you're basically trying to find endangered butterflies in your area. Unfortunately, your area has been overpopulated by machinery and big tech, and you're trying to capture these butterflies and then release them somewhere safer so that the butterflies can continue to flourish and populate due to the fact that the area you're currently in isn't going to sustain the life of the butterflies in order for them to survive. All of these games are really easy to teach, they're really simple, as well as uh, the complexity and strategy kind of improves as the game goes on and on, and you start to learn the different strategies and unique aspects of each one of these games. They all function differently, but because they're all in a single collection on Kickstarter, we'll go ahead and talk about each one of them, how they function, and give you the idea of basically very simple as an idea of the rules of the game, and then we're going to come up and I will review each one of the games and talk about them individually with you and let you know whether or not you would want to pick them up based on what's right for you in the Steve Finn 2020 board game collection. Okay, let's come up and I will show you all the games and let's talk about some of them. Here we have Steve Finn Games Collection, and as you can see, I've set up all four of the games on my table. They don't take up a huge amount of space, so you'll be able to play on small surfaces with them, and we will go over them one at a time. And the first one we're going to be talking about here is Biblios Quill and Parchment. It does play one player, two, three, and four players, but there is a variant for one, and of course a variant for two as well, with some unique little twists to it. But regardless, the game is pretty simple as to how it plays. Everybody's going to get six die. They're going to get three of these book style die, they're going to get these influence die, and then they're going to get these walk this walking die. The die is basically going to allow them to move their abbot around the area. They're going to allow them to gather influence, the higher the number the better, so they can use those during the second phase of the game. And you'll also be rolling these book die, which allow you to gather books, as you can see over here, and you're going to be marking them down. Everybody's going to roll three times. And you can choose to either roll singularly, one die at a time, roll them all, then one die, then one die, or you can roll, roll, and roll all of the dice. So it's basically just like Yahtzee, but instead of picking and choosing, you only have two options. Either roll one die, and that counts as a reroll, or roll all of your die up to three times. And then after that, everybody's going to mark everything onto their player boards. If you have a chapel symbol, you're going to go ahead and look at this board over here and you'll move yourself up on this little chapel or temple area and score points that way as well at the end of the game and potentially gain more resources. Some, some little unique twists to it as to how you'll move your abbot around and collect various different types of books as you're also going to try and gather these monastery locations. And the more you can get to, the more points you'll get. Four rounds of that. After the fourth round, you move on to the second phase 
of the game, in which case you're going to be using this player board here. This is going to be a modifier for based on the amount of books you have. Whoever has the most books in each category was going to score more points at the end of the game. You're going to be setting separate sets of die here, which are neutral die. You'll be bidding on them using your influence points on the board here. And as you bid on them, you'll be able to then select your favorite set of die. And of course, in a two player game, there's a unique player that will add the third. But otherwise, in a three and four player game, that will determine the amount of sets. Each of the sets will also have a unique ability, whether it be to increase or decrease the modifiers here, move your abbot of space, turn one of the die you don't want into a chapel, or finally you'll be able to re-roll a die. And you'll be utilizing those to increase your benefits on your board. You'll do that four times, and afterwards you're going to score points. Whoever has the most in each category of books will score a multiplier of three, two, one, or half a point. Based on the die there, you'll multiply it by that, and you'll add up those points. You'll also score points for your chapel area, and based on whoever has the highest marker there will score points, so on and so forth. If you can get to the certain temples, based on the die you don't use, you can get two points for each of those. And of course, if you get to the top of these tracks here for the books, you're also going to score points as well. You'll tally up all of your points based on this little chart here. It's very easy, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game is a winner. There are two different versions of the game the simple and the more complex. Start with the A side and then move on with the B side. That is Biblios, Quill, and Parchment, a roll and write style game with a single player variant. Let's go ahead and talk about our next one, which is over here, Nanga Parbat. Here's Nanga Parbat. This is the Sherpa slash your guide or touring of the mountain here. And the way it functions is a two player game only. And players are going to start with zero victory points, place them there. You're going to go ahead and randomly allocate all of these animals in these different pyramid sections in the mountain. And then you're going to have your Sherpa here and you're gonna place them in a random area as well. And players are simply going to go back and forth selecting their animals based on where the Sherpa is at. So if I want this animal, I can go ahead and place my guy here. This is going to go to my player board based on the areas in which the animals are at. And then based on where I selected the animal, my Sherpa will move to. So in this case, he would stay to be in the same area. However, if I didn't select this one and I selected this one instead, then I would look at this pyramid here and I'd look, okay, top to the uh, left. So right there. And then the next player would get to go ahead and choose an animal as well. So if they took this one over here, in which case they'd place one of their little meeples here, this guy would then move over here. And it's just going to go like that back and forth. You're going to be selecting animals, placing them in their areas, placing down your little characters. And then at a certain point, you can choose to remove your characters and place tents in their stead based on the victory conditions here. You're going to want to try and get the same amount of animals. You're going to want to try and get different amounts of animals. And you're going to want to try and get as many of your little characters in an area as possible that connect. And there's little connecting lines as well. And you'll remove those based on whether you have three, four, five, or six connecting to each other. And you'll take your little cubes and place them on the board and score victory points based on how well you did. Now, of course, there's another unique little twist too. All the animals have abilities and they start off off as unused and then when you use them they'll stay on your board so you can turn them in for victory points but otherwise you'll actually be able to uh, use them as some unique twists so for instance I can move two unique characters mine and my opponents as if as long as they're adjacent I can switch an adjacent character and an animal I can switch two animals from anywhere and I can also move my Sherpa and these are the four different abilities one over here, this little goat is basically a wild and it counts towards your victory conditions. And the final one over there is basically these little meerkats or little muskrats. You'll basically be utilizing those when you when you pick them up. You're going to determine if you have the least amount of points and you can score one point if you do. And you can also use those for victory point conditions. The game will end when you've run out of your little followers here or you've placed all your point scoring markers on the board here. And the person who has the most points at the end of the game is going to be the winner. There's also some unique little twists as well in variants where you're going to look at the board in more detail to determine who got some extra victory conditions if that's the case. But regardless, you're trying to make camps and progress the board and trying to thwart your opponent by selecting or making choices in selective placement during this game. Okay, next one. Let's talk about the butterfly garden. Here we have the Butterfly Garden. This game plays two to five players and is a game in which you're going to be placing cards down that hold butterflies and they'll have numbers on them. Every player is going to get a board as well as one of those little nets there and they're going to get a certain number of cards in their hand which are going to have numbers, potentially powers, and butterflies on them which you will be utilizing throughout the game in order to gain these specific cards here. And these cards will give you victory points at the end of the game. Depending on the number of players is how many cards you set out from 
the deck that will have little butterflies on them that will basically allow you to gain new cards for your hand and also the extra player boards will be set aside if you don't play with them so this is what a two player game would look like and the game is pretty simple each player is going to take one of their cards set it face down in front of them and then they're going to reveal the cards and based on the player who has the lowest number they are going to then go ahead and select one of the butterflies here and it'll go in order from there and then after that, they'll take their butterfly cards, they'll use their abilities if they have any, and they have unique abilities on them, and then they're going to go ahead and slide them into their jar. And the jar is nice because you're going to be able to still see the butterflies that you have acquired throughout the game in the jar by turning the card to the side. And then from there, you can go ahead and collect butterflies in turn order from these little butterfly field areas. So in this case here, you have a blue and a green, and this is a blue one and a wild. So this player could turn this card in and gather this as victory points. And then, of course, after they've done that, they'll take their little flags or little nets back. They'll take the cards back into their hand that they chose. And in this case, they're going to refresh, remove this card for a two-player game, and then bring out more cards once again to continue going back and forth. Now, depending on the number of butterflies you collect, you'll score more victory points. And the game is going to end when either this deck or this deck runs out. Once one of the decks has run out, you'll tally up the points in the top left-hand corner of the card. You'll score bonuses for having different colors available to you as victory points as well as the cards in your hand and the butterflies they're represented in as well as the butterflies in your jar and whoever has the most points is the winner it's a rather simple little game with some unique little twists as well as some unique little abilities but it all in all is a pretty simple teach and i think it's something you could probably understand how to play just in this simple explanation last one mining colony the final game I want to talk about is Mining Colony that plays one to four players. And in this one is kind of a trick taking game in which you're going to be getting a deck of player cards here with numbers on them. And each deck is somewhat different than all of the others, in which case if I have 54 and he, he'll have 53, she'll have 52. But in the long run, I'm going to have smaller cards if I have the higher ones on the higher end. I'll have lower ones on the lower end as well. And in this game, it's pretty simple. You'll have 10 of these cards here and you'll be flipping them over. There there are all of these cards, before we even talk about that, there are all of these little tiles here which you want to make your board. This is like a finished game of what two players will look like. And these are going to populate this board here. You're going to have your scoring paper over here. There's some tokens you can gain if you don't have any use for certain items. You're going to have all of these crystals which will give you specific benefits. And then additional player boards, player de cards, as well as all the different tokens and whatnot. Here's how the game works though. You'll flip over one of these cards here and then you're going to fill the board up based on the number of players. One, two, three, and four. You'll take the exact type of tokens and place them in the area based on what the card asks for. And you'll do that for each area as well. So in this case, you have one here, and then you have a yellow and a white. And then this card is going to be one of the only 10 rounds in the game. After that, each player is going to draw three cards and choose one of them and place it face up simultaneously with, simultaneously with the other players. And your cards are numbered and colored to show the difference. And in this case, the player with the higher number is the one that is going to be able to take first from either of these two areas. The other player is going to get the other one. Or with more players, then it's going to go from the highest to the lowest. And there's never going to be a tie. And once you've played these cards, they're gone forever. And the reason why you may not want to play a larger card, because some players have larger and other, larger cards than others is because at the end of the game you'll score victory points if you have the highest converted cost of the last two cards in your deck that you did not play. Players will take these little tokens and place them on their board along with these crystals. You'll have certain sides of your board, whether it be this area here, which is already constructed area. You can just simply place things there, but once you do, that's going to be it. You cannot remove them and move them around. Over here is a storage area for your tokens as well as for your ships, your people, and your little gems, in which case you can move them back and forth and you can also get rid of them for tokens. Each piece you get rid of or don't use, you can convert into a token, which you can use for these little areas here. You can convert areas that are already built on your board that are blue blank or not, and place these on top of them, thusly changing the world around you and allowing you to build unique things. The idea of the game is to build specific locations, and you need to do that by placing a ship and a person, and they have them be the same color, and then inside you can go ahead and place that specific building, or you can choose to have two of the same gem and place a same color little chapel or steeple here. I don't know if terraformer, I suppose. There's a limited number of supply based on the number of players, and if it's already been built, you cannot build 
build it. However, placing still is going to grant you victory points at the end of the game. After everybody has went ahead and placed, then you're going to go ahead and flip over a new card because this board will be emptied and you're going to refill the board once again. And when you refill the board once again, players are going to flip over their cards and they're going to draw three. They'll pick one and reveal. Tokens are useful when it comes to one to one placing these as well as you can discard a token to discard the three cards you have in your hand, put them on the bottom of your deck and draw three new cards. The only time you ever lose cards from your deck is when you play the cards. Otherwise, they're going to go back to the bottom of your deck. The game is going to end when all of these cards run out. And when they do, you're going to tally up points. It'll be based on the amount of factories and locations you have. It'll be based on the number of people as well as uh, the ships and the little gems. And that's going to be based on two for one for these little tokens here. And whoever has, oh, and finally, of course, whoever has the largest two cards left over in their deck and whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. You also want to be careful to not have empty spaces left over because you will lose points and make sure to try and fill your board up as best as possible when you're placing down these things. Certain rules and requirements are going to state whether or not you can place a gem on a specific area based on if they have the same color, as well as the ships can only go in the shipyards and the people can only go in the colonization areas. And that's pretty much the idea of Mining Colony, 10 rounds of flipping cards and placing your little tokens and your little pieces and squares along your board to try and score as many points as you possibly can. Let's talk about all four games. I'll give you my review for each one of them and I'll also timestamp them for you. In backwards order are reviews. Let's talk about this one over here, Mining Colony. And in Mining Colony, like I was talking about, you're basically just placing down Tetris pieces on a board, attempting to fill in the right spaces, acquiring certain areas to place certain things in order to achieve your factories and your little steeples, your little, I don't know what they're called, I should have looked at the words, but this guy here. And of course, those are going to score you a lot of points, and they're like kind of extra bonus points in the game. And you're trying to fill your board up with all kinds of stuff, it's important, and that ties in with the theme of the game. At a certain point throughout the game, if you're not successfully achieving the right cards in your hand or not playing the correct way or you're not gathering certain things, it might get to the point where you just cannot win. That'd probably be one of the main things that people will be like, ah, oh, you know, I, I, I can't come back at this point. But that has a lot to do with choice and how you choose to like play certain things and gather certain things. And of course, realizing that your deck is different than other people's. Do you obviously always want to go and collect and save the biggest cards or is it more important to you? Use those two big cards in an attempt to get the spaces that you want to collect from. And in some cases, yes, some cases, no. If you want to go for both, that's fine. If everybody else is as well, then it comes down to you. The next two highest cards being the highest cards in the game, which is an interesting thing to think about as well. The game looks very nice. It has a bunch of really cute little wooden custom meeples to it. I remember playing this game originally when it was a solo slash two player game, and this one has incorporated three and a four player mode as well. I like it at three. I like it at four players as well. Uh, slight changes to the game as far as the two player go. And uh, they added basically these little tokens here that you can place onto your board that will allow you to change your board up so that you can be able to satisfy the needs and conditions of the things that you gather. There's these little tokens that whenever you don't get some, use something, you can discard it and gain one of these, or even a tile itself. And these can be used to switch up the cards in your hand for later use, which is kind of a nice little catch-up mechanic. Especially if you gather more resources than you technically need or can hold, then that can be a benefit to you later as opposed to it just being useless. I really enjoy this game. It reminds me of Star Colonies, the game I played from Floodgate Games, uh, which is kind of similar, in which case you play in the cards down and they provide an ability and you go in order and you can either choose to store or collect uh, or build or collect. In this one here, it is the same aspect of simultaneous flipping of the cards, but this focuses way more on the building and managing of the different pieces on your board, as well as, of course, the little meeples. So it's definitely a different game. Uh, is it, I think you should probably choose one of the the other they're they're similar in that nature but they're definitely different games uh the next one here let's talk about Butterfly Garden. This is the next one I'm going to talk about in order. Uh, Butterfly Garden is a very simple game in which it's simultaneous flipping and you're choosing to basically play cards uh, and gather and the higher cards are going to basically let you have more butterflies it'll be better and the lower cards will be not as good but the lower cards will let you go first in choosing the butterflies which can be very beneficial to you uh, the sweet spot is going to be somewhere in the middle most likely so that you'll still be able to gather what you want and not get stuck or left over with something you don't want the game is rather unique in the fact that you are gathering butterflies and moving around it reminds me of Mario Mariposas the one that 
Elizabeth Hargrave is doing, the same kind of feeling as far as like the butterflies are having an issue and you need to go ahead and protect them. The theme fits well in this game. It's very beautiful. It's got tons of beautiful artwork as far as the butterflies go. Really, really well done. It's definitely a game that's more puzzly in nature, something my wife enjoys more. It's personally not, it's probably my least favorite in all of these four games just because of the puzzling nature in it there's no like negatives or critiques i can really think of other than just i'm not very good at them having to like plan steps ahead in order to gather specific butterflies and uh, attempt to get the cards and also i another thing that drives me nuts is i'm preparing for the car the butterfly field that i want i've got my butterflies in a jar and somebody else has beat me to it by one butterfly in their jar and they discard they get the card and now i'm stuck with these butterflies that i now have to make do in a different way to gather the points that i need and so there's a lot of thinking a lot of strategies or Zacco is a lot of puzzly nature and it's puzzly aspects all right next one this one over here is Nanga Par Parbat I think that's the one problem with me is I don't know the, it's hard to say the name <laughs> but you're playing as Sherpas it's a two-player game so it's a two-player game first of all in which case you're just going back and forth gathering animals and utilizing those animals when you want on your turn to position camps and to be able to score three different types of victory points and you're gathering the different unique animals you try to get the same and you're also trying to build the tents and mess with your opponent there's a ton of different strategy to it choosing where you want to gather the animals makes a big difference as what type of animal animals as well so there's a lot of flexibility in the game it's rather quick plays about 25 minutes i would say maybe a little longer if you're really thinking about it but there's a lot of deep strategy in the game that is very very simplistic in nature placing gathering an animal in the selected area moving the sherpa to the area in which the animal that you selected is in and then continuing until one of the two victory condition runs out all of these games also have a nice variant or two to them and they have uniqueness as well uh, this one is a nice two-player game it's actually one of my preferred two-player games now it's one if i want a little bit of strategy i want something quick and i want something that's going to wet my whistle for it. it's a deep thinking game that doesn't require a lengthy amount of play and this one was one i'm definitely going to jump on this is i'm gonna keep this one in my shelf for sure especially when i'm playing with people like callie because i'll have a chance to beat her at it <laughs> biblios quill and parchment i haven't played the original biblios but i have played the roll and write version i have I've now turned the leaf. I used to hate Roll and Writes. I used to not be a big fan of them. And now I've started to really like them, especially when they've come out with unique little twists to them, like this one. This one, you're worried about moving the abbot around. You're also worried about moving up the temple. You want to gather your books. You want to gather favor that you can use to bid. There's two different phases for the Roll and Write, but they both are used to score points in the same way on your paper. And then, of course, there's a single player mode and the two player mode that adds a unique twist, which is a separate little uh, abbot that's moving around the board as well as messing with your scoring. And you have to kind of pay attention to him as well and they have additional variants to the game of the four of these biblios is my favorite personal game because there's just a lot to it it's not too complex even though it looks the most complex of the bunch but it still plays at a reasonable amount of time and it has this like unique like chapter two twist to it that makes you want to choose between the four different abilities or the different dice that you want to collect and there's a lot of things that you can do it's also different because it's not like yahtzee where you can roll the six die choose three and roll you have to roll the six die choose one or roll all of them again and so it makes this big difference as to do you really like your full roll or is it just this one die that's the problem or these two die and you have to kind of make those type of choices and sometimes you'll get stuck with even worse than what you got previously because you chose to roll. So sometimes it's better to just roll once and be happy with what you have. But otherwise, a very, very fun game. Probably my least favorite in the theme of these four games, but overall in gameplay, I really like it. And all the themes for all of these games fit very nicely. Quality of the components are very, very nice as well. I'm not sure if this is the fully produced version of the game, but if it is, it wouldn't surprise me, but it might not. They might be slightly more uh, higher quality, but overall I'm satisfied with the condition of these games. They're very nice. All the rulebook make sense. I learned how to play them in roughly 35 minutes for each of them, and I can teach them about five to six minutes for all of these games as well. As you see in this video, you probably know how to play mostly all of these games by now. I really, really liked them. If I were to pick my order, though, it would be Biblios, then it would be Nanga, and then I'd probably go with 
the mining colony, and finally the butterfly garden, just because I'm terrible at puzzle games, but they're all very different. You want a puzzle game? You want a tetromino game? Do you want a roll and write? Or do you want a two player back and forth strategy game? A lot of options in this collection here, and a lot of choices for you to pick up on the Kickstarter if you're interested. All of them have their own unique you know, favors and disadvantages depending on the player, but all of them overall are an enjoyable bunch of games. I always have, I've played all the Steve Finn games pretty much, and I've liked all of them. They've all been a lot of fun. And these are like miniaturized versions of a lot of those games. So if you like those ones, these ones are going to be in the same vein, but they're also uniquely different, but have that same touch as well. I enjoy these four games. And I hope you guys will take a look down below in the Kickstarter campaign. If you're interested, check down below Steve Finn Games. They're producing their 2020 collection. Let me know what you think. What are your favorite games of these four? Do they remind you of any games? Because they definitely do. Each of them remind me of something, some game I've played before, except for Nanga, I think. That's probably the most unique one. I don't think I've seen a game like that one. But overall, they do have their reminiscence, especially the Star Colonies one and the Mining Colony. They, they're very similar in nature. But anyway, let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section. And outro. I'm hot. It's really hot in here. Thank you for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game or board games review, the Steve Finn Collection. If you're interested, like I said below, below, check it out. As well as subscribe to the channel. It couldn't hurt, right? You've already finished watching the full video. Like, comment, subscribe, whatever. The, the bell notification button, it's really greatly appreciated. Check out our live streams. We play games just like this one every Wednesday on Facebook and Twitch, 6.30 p.m. PST. Join us and we have fun. We, we give away games. We give away games on the site, Unfiltered Gamer. We have a Discord, we have a Patreon. If you want to support us in those ways, we do appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, we look forward to herding sheep, building colonies on new planets, gathering and releasing butterflies in safe areas, and being an abbot and researching the mythic, the, not mythical, the unique biblical parchment texts with you next time.